except for the examples uh, is in, in Landsberg, except for explicit matrices, is, is in Landsberg's book that's traveling around the room and each of you is asked to spend one minute with the book, you know, as it's traveling around and then at the end it goes back to the gentleman over there. When we're done today, we have only one week left and then the really exciting part, the new part of this course will begin. The very last week is on algebraic statistics and it's exciting because I think for many of you that's the least familiar part of, of the course. I mean, we all have heard about some of the more mathematical topics, but statistics is sort of a, an unknown for, for many of you. And, uh, but it's everywhere, you know, whether you like it or not. So let me, do you want to move over, Matt? You can yeah, sort of yeah. roll in there. Um, we had this very nice lecture by a, a colleague, a Korean applied mathematician at NIMS a couple of weeks ago who talked about his group's work and non-negative matrix factorization and the many applications. And I thought he said an interesting sentence, which I will take the liberty to criticize now. I think he said an interesting sentence at the beginning. He said uh, that his group is, is working on data analysis, big data, but without statistics. So he literally said the work, my, way, my work is, way, uh, my group is working on big data, but without statistics. In my opinion, this sentence doesn't make sense. It's like saying I'm cooking soup, but without water. By definition, statistics is the science of data. Science of data and data analysis, okay? So, so with that in mind, um, even if applied mathematicians or economists or others think they're not doing statistics, as soon as they're analyzing data, one way or another they are using or developing possibly new tools of statistics and uh, we want to look at this from the point of view of nonlinear algebra starting next Thursday at 10 a.m. Today we're going to go back to uh, representation theory so I'm going to zip through the uh, 6162 and then take more time on 64 and 65 of Landsberg's book. So Schur's lemma says that if V and W are irreducible representations of a finite group, irreducible G modules, modules over the group algebra, and F from V to W is a G module homomorphism. So both V and W uh, are representations of our finite group G. So G acts on V as a subgroup of GLV by some row and acts by some other row on uh, V, on W. And there's a linear map that uh, respects this action. Then, according to Shor, either F is the linear map zero or V is equal to W and F is just the scaling of the identity matrix for some lambda in the ground field. So here I'm taking my ground field to be the complex numbers. Things are a bit more difficult over finite fields but the lambda, so my ground field is the complex numbers and by an irreducible representation, irreducible module I mean one that has no non-trivial invariant subspace. Okay? So there's no subspace of V that's not zero and not the whole space that's left invariant by all the matrices in, in the matrix group, in, in the representation. That's an irreducible representation. Okay, so for finite groups, we know, for instance, by math Dr. Bob, so according to math, Dr. Bob, we know that isomorphism classes of irreducible G modules, where G is a finite group, are in bijection with the conjugacy classes of the group. 
So for the symmetric group S4, there are five conjugacy classes and there are also five irreducible <coughs> representations. For the symmetric group S5 in the last homework, there are how many conjugacy classes? Six. Six, seven. 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 seven, okay. So the symmetric group on five letters has seven conjugacy classes and there are seven irreducible representations, so Bob's character table will be a seven by seven table. Now each irreducible representation appears as a submodule in a particular module called the regular representation of CG is called the regular representation and C of G is just the group algebra of G. Okay, so G is a finite group. So C of G is the C vector space with basis G. So if G is S4, this is a 24 dimensional complex vector space. Yes, yes, with a distinguished basis. Uh, moreover, this is an algebra and the algebra, it's a non-commutative algebra with uh, multiplication coming from the group. Right, so it's the, the vector space with basis, the group elements, and multiplication, you know, it's just the group multiplication on the generators and then by linearity extended to, to everybody else. Uh, we know, then we form the characters in the character table. So the characters are the traces of the matrices in the irreducible representations. We write them in the rows of the character table and then with that, they're orthonormal with respect to the inner product, just the dot product uh, where we uh, take the sum over the group elements. Okay, so these are basic facts about finite groups <coughs> and their representations over the complex numbers. Now in 6.3, Landsberg then particularly goes on to talk about the symmetric group. Representations of the symmetric group. So there, to study the representations of the symmetric group, we have a particular combinatorics, combinatorial gadgets that we use to speak about them and to study them. So for example, we talk about uh, things like partitions, partitions of an integer, we're going to talk about the young tableau, young symmetrizers, something, the hook length formula, blah, 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 blah. So the, the entire, there's an entire field called algebraic combinatorics, a large part of which deals with the, the study of partitions and tableaus, symmetric polynomials, how to multiply them, and so on. And uh, that is sort of the, uh, the combinatorial language we use to speak about the uh, character table and irreducible representations of the symmetric group. So let's revisit one more time the example of S4. So for me S4 is a group that's uh, presented by three generators. The name of these generators are 1, 2, 2, 3 and 3, 4. This diagram, this Dinkin diagram, tells us the commutation relations on this group. Right? So each of these generators is idempotent, so is a, an element of order 2. Um, if you have two nodes that are not adjacent in the graph, then the generators commute. But if you have two nodes that are not adjacent in the graph, uh, then they don't quite commute, but you have the so-called braid relations 
one, two, two, three, one, two is equal to two, three, one, two, two, three. And uh, together with this, that's equivalent to saying that the third power of the product is zero. And then the, the analogous for the other edge of the diagram, which is two, three, three, four, two, three, three, four, two, three, three, four. Okay, so this is just the, this picture is a shorthand notation for these relations among three generators of some mysterious group. Now this mysterious group, if you work it out, you multiply out and you use, you use these relations, you will find that this mysterious group has 24 elements and it's a familiar example. But if you draw other graphs, such as the E8 graph, you get a large finite group. The E9 graph, you get an a analogous infinite group and you can use that to uh, in, in Nagata's theorem, for example. Okay, so here is the uh, symmetric group. Now, the group algebra, the regular representation of S4 as a vector space is a 24-dimensional vector space whose basis are the permutations. So this is an S module, is an S4 module, by left multiplication. Okay? So what I'm saying, I'm saying this is an S4 module, I mean that every permutation of a four element set I have now represented by a 24 by 24 permutation matrix. We clear on that? Right. So in this representation we have 24 matrices of size 24 by 24. These are permutation matrices and the rows and columns are labeled by the basis, that is to say by the permutations. So it's just the left action on the group. Okay. Now there's a decomposition of this group. So in this space, in this 24 dimensional vector space, you can now change the basis. You can now change the basis so that simultaneously all 24 matrices block diagonalize in a nice pattern that I will draw here. Okay? So when I say every vector space comes to me with the basis, I don't mean that I don't occasionally change the basis. Right? Of course, even if it comes to me, sometimes I might take my basis, I change it, make a better basis. So in this case, I'm given a basis, um, but I'm going to change it. Okay? So in this new basis, the block decomposition looks like this. There will be a small one by one block, then there will be three three by three blocks, and we're going to see the same matrices in each of them. Okay, so there will be three three by three matrices that are the same. Okay, next comes two two by two matrices that are the same. And then comes another three copies of three by three matrices, different three by three matrices but the same. And finally for good measure of symmetry, there's another tiny one by one block. Okay? And everything else is zero. So we have taken the regular representation and decomposed it into irreducible representations. Each of these blocks are irreducible representations. And carrying out such a decomposition is the difference between being able to do a calculation and not being able to do a calculation. For example, in semi-definite programming, Pablo and his students, as you heard, they know how to do this very well. The engineering students at MIT know how to do this. The physicists at CERN know how to do this. Right? It's the difference. So being able to change the basis and block diagonalize your matrices is the difference, makes the difference between being able to do 
the linear algebra calculation and not being able to do the linear algebra and non-linear algebra as Luke explained in his lecture. So what are these matrices? Okay. Now this upper one upper block here is always just one. So in every each of my 24 matrices, this is has the entry one. This matrix down here always has the entry minus one. And the other entries, the other matrices, you know, for, for the generators of the group. The other matrices, well, they're over there. There are certain matrices that have entries 0, plus 1, or minus 1, and they're given by this pattern. Okay? Now, in my new basis, so I'm going to pick a new basis, and I'm going to label just the rows and the columns of my little blocks. Right? So, um, in these little blocks, I'm going to concentrate, you know, so I'm going to, I said this matrix, these are all the same, so I'm just going to look at one of them. I'm going to pick a representative, you know, for each of these classes, these isotypical classes, and I'm going to tell you now the names of the rows and columns of those blue matrices in my new basis. Okay? So for example, for this one by one block, so they are named by fillings of the five partitions of four. So the integer 4 has five partitions indicated here in yellow by these filled young tableau. And I'm filling these young tableau with the integers 1 up to n, 1 up to 4. And the rule is, the rule is that uh, in every row and every column the numbers must increase. Okay, so for example here there's only one filling, you know, this, this one, and that's a basis of a one-dimensional vector space. Okay? Then here for this shape, there are three ways to fill this, and this is the basis, the names of the basis for a three-dimensional vector space. Here there are two ways to fill this, here there are three ways, and here's one way. Okay? That clear? So I draw the partitions of four, of which there are five. For S5, I draw the seven partitions and I fill them with the numbers 1 up to n in such a way that the rows and columns are increasing. So these are so-called standard Young tableau. These are my basis, the names of my basis vectors. Now how am I going to make these matrices? Well, how do you make any matrix, right? You apply the endomorphism to the basis vector. So if you apply it to the first basis vector, and you take the image and you expand it in the basis, that gives you the first column of the matrix. Right? The columns of the matrices are the images of the basis vectors. Okay? Well, how do I act on this? Well, let's do it for the generators. Okay? So, for example, the generator of the group 1, 2 just switches the label of 1 and 2. Okay, so let's do that. Right? So, if I take this picture, it just means I'm switching the positions of 1 and 2. Should I do this correctly, right? So I get, you know, 2, 1, 3, 4. Here I'm switching, you know, 2 and 3, so I go 3, 2, and finally I go 1, 2, 4, 3. Okay? Now these things are not in my basis. Right? They look a little different. It's not the same, right? But I, I declare that if I make permutations uh, along the columns, that that just keeps the same. Uh, so I'm claiming, you know, whenever I see a column like this, I can swip, swap along a column. So this is just the, the same, you know, as 1, 2, 3, 4 in my vector space, so therefore I get the entry 1. Now on the rows, it's a little different. On the rows, I'm anti-symmetrizing. Sorry, Frank. So on the rows, I'm anti-symmetrizing. So here I'm doing the same thing. I'm swapping 2 and 1. 2, 1, 3, 4. And here I go, you know, 1, 3, 2, 4. And here I go, 1, 2, 4, 3. But in the rows, I'm anti-symmetrizing. I'm symmetrizing in the columns, I'm anti-symmetrizing. So if I see, you know, 2 and 1, I want to bring it in order, then I pick up a minus sign. So this is minus 
one, two, three, four, and therefore the entry in this one by one matrix is minus one. Okay? Let's try it, okay? So, oh, so this is sort of how it goes, and then there are some relations, and all the relations I'm ever going to use are the Plücker relations. The Plücker relations for the Grassmannian. I'm going to use the relation, you know, P14 times P23 equals P13 times P24 minus P12 times P34. That's the only relation I'm ever going to use. Let's remember this. I better erase this because I'm on record. I probably said a lot of offensive things in this course. So, okay. So the only relation I'm ever going to use is the Plücker relation, which goes like this. One, two, three, four. This is not in my basis, right, because the second column is not increasing, but I can fix it by my Plücker relation. It's one, three, two, four minus 1, 2, 3, 4, right? So P14 times P23, blah, blah, okay? Let's, so let's try it out, okay? So here, for example, the first basis vector, I'm swapping 1 and 2. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. I'm anti-symmetrizing in the rows, absolutely, yeah? So it's correct. So the image of this basis vector is 2, 1, 3, 4, but that's the same as minus that, so therefore the first column is minus 1, 0. So is that clear? I'm not sure whether I... Abraham, you look puzzled. Am I okay? You, you okay? So, I mean, if you take the first two basis thing, um, you know, the 1, 2, 3, 4, the first two vectors... This one? So you can switch... The, the, 1 and 2, and then 2 and 3, and then... I'm, I'm just applying one switch. Yeah, but you can apply three switches to get from one to the other. Doesn't that mean they're... Almost... Yeah. So you can apply... You can switch 1 and 2, and then 2 and 3, and then 1 and 3. So, yeah, so to get You mean that they are, you, you're arguing with my little rule they should be linear dependent? Or? Yeah. I, mean, I hope not. <laughs> if you switch things on the rows and on the columns, you might get from each one. Oh, no, no. So, um, I think you pick up things that aren't in the basis when you do that. Yeah. Way. So you have to use the linear relations. I have to always use the linear relations, yeah. So let's try this one. Let's do this one, okay? So one, four, two, three, okay? So the image would be something like uh, 4, 3, 1, 2. No. Oh, I'm switching 1 and 2. Sorry, guys. Yeah, so it's hard to do this on the blackboard, you know. So 2, 1, 4, 3. Okay, so that's not in the basis. Okay? So now let's you know, do that using this principle, okay? So now I want to write this in the basis. 2, 4, 1, 3, okay? Well, it's not quite a plucker, you know, I don't have enough, so I'm missing something here, right? So I'm going to make this into, so I'm just kind of, I'm generous and I'm going to put some other things in. How about 5 and 6? And later I'm going to delete them again, right? Might as well, right? So now I can rewrite this. First of all, so this is P24 times P15 times P34, 3, 6. So, you know, I'm in a commutative algebra, so this is certainly the same as 1, 5, 2, 4, 3, 6. <laughs> is that clear? I haven't done anything. This is just the you know, notation, right? This is P24 times P15 times P36. But now I'm going to do a Plücker relation, right? So this one here is equal to uh, 1, 4, 2, 5. I do nothing on the last factor. And then minus or plus uh, 1, 2, 4, 5, 3, 6. 
Okay, and now I'm, I have to do it one more time, right? So I've swapped these, so three and four, six and five, okay, and blah, 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 you know. And the very end, everything you see, I picked the be best example, I can peel off the five and the six again, and I get, you know, this linear combination of the bases. Okay, shall we do an easier one? Okay, let's do, let's how about, let's do this one, okay? Okay, ready? So I take this one, one, three, two, four. So I'm swapping three and four. So I get one, two, four, three, and that's really equal, you know, to one, three, two, four, minus one, two, three, four, and that's the correct column. Okay, so that's how it goes. So with a little help from Math Dr. Bob, or even without, you can do this for larger symmetric groups, Spencer. No. Okay. I'm using the Blucher relations, because okay. I like the Grassmann. Okay. okay, so that's how it goes. <clears throat> there are many ways to realize this, and this has a name, you know. Um, some people call them Garnier relations, but I just like to think about the Plucker relation, because that's the simplest to remember. So in general, for Sn, the symmetric group, let me write bracket pi, and that's Landsberg's notation. The book is going around, everybody spends exactly one minute with the book. So Landsberg writes bracket pi for the irreducible representation, for the irrep. So irrep is short for irreducible representation, indexed by partition, by the partition pi. of n. Okay, so pi is that irreducible representation. So this three-dimensional vector space with this action of the symmetric group would be called bracket and then I write the partition. Or maybe bracket, you know, two, one, one or something like that. Okay, well that's the, the irreducible representation. These things are called Specht modules. Specht modules. Okay, so the Specht module is the irreducible representation given by a particular partition. So Visarion gives me a partition of 11, you know, such as, you know, 4, 3, 3, 1. Okay, then bracket 4, 3, 3, 1 is the name of a certain complex vector space whose dimension is the number of legal fillings of his Young diagram and that vector space has that basis and on that vector space the symmetric group S11 acts by uh, you know matrices like this whose names where the, the rows and columns are indexed in this way. This is the Specht model. Now a question you might ask is how to compute, how to decompose a given representation <coughs> into irreducibles. And the answer is it's actually not so easy. It requires some practice. Okay, so if I give you a some representation of the symmetric group. So for example, you know, on, you find lots and lots of material you know, on, on the web. So for example, you know, you take the, uh, take the four-dimensional cube. S4 acts on the two-dimensional faces of the four-dimensional cube. That's a representation, right? So the four-dimensional cube has how many two-dimensional faces? Maybe 40, okay? So it has a certain number of two-dimensional faces and S4 permutes them, right? So I've just given you 24 40 by 40 matrices 
And we might want to black block diagonalize them. We might want to actually, you know, find, decompose this into irreducible representations. And that's actually not so easy. That requires a lot of practice, okay? But in life, you know, things require practice, right? Snowboarding, playing the piano, even bicycling, if you've never done it, requires practice. So decomposing SN modules into irreducible representation uh, requires practice, and it, I won't promise as, as, as much fun as snowboarding, but it's okay, okay? And you can practice it, okay? So, um, now along the way, there's a useful tool namely computing traces and use the character table. <laughs> right? Well, you can calculate the trace of your given representation. Right? So you, you can look at how your you know, permutations act on the objects, you know, your, on the objects you're permuting, you can look, you know, how many fixed points there are, right? For example, you look at the fixed point structure and you can read off the trace of each of your matrices. One per conjugacy class, right? For each conjugacy class, you can say, you know, the two cycle has trace seven and the three cycle has some trace and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So each conjugacy class has some trace. Then you write those traces as a row vector. And then you expand that row vector into the orthonormal basis given by the rows of Bob's character table. And that's very easy. If you have an orthonormal basis, then you can just multiply, take the inner product, right? If you have an orthonormal basis for some real vector space and you want to find the coefficients in the expansion in that basis, all you need to do is do the, the, the inner product, okay? So you take the traces of your representation you take the dot product against each row vector in the character table and so you multiply the character table you know on by your column vector let's say and then the, the numbers you get are the multiplicities with which each irreducible representation bracket pi occurs in your representation that is the first step that is the formal analysis that tells you tells you how many copies of each irreducible representation occurs in your representation. Right? Then comes the harder part, which is to actually you know, change the basis, actually carry out the block diagonalization. But this can all be done. So I like to use today the same format as last time, namely three shorter lectures with four minute breaks, and we've reached the first four minute break. <laughs>